All right. Welcome everybody to week two, day one. Let me share my stream. All right. All right. All right. So, how is the Josephus problem going for y'all? I've only been getting a couple questions on it, so that means it's either too easy or we haven't started yet. So, let's talk about the Josephus problem. Hmm? A little tough, eh? Headache inducing. All right, well, let's, let me run the thing for you, CD Josephus reference, and I'll even copy it out into public Josephus so that you can um, run it yourself. So if you wanna run my version public Josephus, edit it out, you can, you can run it. So if we have, let's say, um, 10 knights, huh? uh, and we will skip nobody. So that means you kill one person and you move right on to the next person. The first knight to be eliminated is knight index five. Which is to say the sixth knight. Then make sure you're printing out who gets eliminated. Some of you aren't doing that. So knight number five gets uh, killed or eliminated, however you want to put it. Depends on which version of the story you want. Then uh, you eliminate knight number five, knight number six, knight number seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three. And the winning knight is the one that remains. So the... Um, Total solution to this is not too bad. Let's see, 31 to 14, 17 lines of code. It's not, it's not like a huge problem or anything. It's just, um, um, I don't know. You, you just kind of need to, to do it. I don't know. I don't know what to say. So, if we run it again, if we've got 10 knights. If we skip one person starting at five, then it kills knight number five. We skip knight number six, that's what the one there means. Kill knight number seven, skip knight number eight, kill knight number nine. Knight number nine, of course, is the last one. So we wrap back around to zero using the power of modulus. All right. I'm trying to use an iterator, but you can't use modulus with it. That's fine. You don't technically have to use modulus. So skip zero, kill one, skip two, kill three, skip four, kill not five, six, skip not seven, skip eight, nine's already gone, so we kill zero, and then we skip, we skip two, three's already gone, so kills four, we skip eight, kill number two, winning night is eight. Thought you needed mod. Uh, there is uh, there is a need for mod in there somewhere. I'm, I'm gonna guarantee that. Okay, so what if we um, have ten knights and we skip twenty knights every time? There is there is a there is a use for it. Okay. Make sure your code doesn't crash. Also, if uh, you pass in too big a number. Okay. So
I will offer extra credit on this assignment. The extra credit will be, I'm going to, I'll put together a test case that has, uh, I don't know, a lot of nights in it. And you need to have an implementation that runs roughly as fast as mine. Yeah, skip being a die case. Mm -mm. It's a circle. If you skip 50 nights, then uh, you just keep going. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the list class. So we can add things to the list class using pushback. I know we don't use lists very often. Some of you are using vectors instead. Uh, trust me when, when I say if you use erase on a vector, um, that's an order in operation when it should be order one. We'll very probably not have a very, very fast implementation. Okay. So we can push back things into a list. Let's push back five, 10, 15, 20. And we can then print out everything in the list. 5, 10, 15, 20, it comes out. Uh, if you want to erase something, well, you need to use something called an iterator. So. If we um, make an iterator, that's equal to list.begin. We can see out the value pointed to by that iterator. That should be five. So an iterator is like a pointer. It's just a more generalized version of a pointer. It's, a, it's essentially a C++ class that works like a pointer. So, how do we move the pointer forwards? Well, you can't use plus equals, unfortunately, even though I think that, um, I think that, um, you know, they should probably overload it. Uh, the only, the only thing you can do with it is do plus plus. So you do iterator plus plus, and then that will, when you create it here, this will be the pointing at five, right? The first element in the list is five. So list.begin points at the first element in the list. If you do it plus plus, then it is now pointing at 10. And if we do it again, it's now pointing at 15. Do it again, it's now pointing at 20. Okay, see where this is going. Now, if we do it again, uh, it is now pointing at list dot end. And if you print out the value, we get four, which, yeah. <laughs> There's no four in the list anywhere. If you advance it again, I don't even know, it might crash now. Back to five. Back to 10, okay. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem, right? Because you, uh, you can't output this value. It's not a, it's not a real value, right? If you iterate, uh, I don't know if it's defined that way. I don't know if I'd trust that. Uh, what I would do is, let me, uh, it's actually a good question. cppreference.com list class to the documentation.
It doesn't actually say. I don't know if that's just a, a coincidence or what. I, I'd have to actually dig into that. I would just do this. I'd just say like if iterator is equal to list.end, iterator equals list.begin. Right? Wrap around to beginning. Get five again. And then we just keep going. Iterator plus plus. Okay. Um, if you want to get the size of the list, you do list dot size. We have four people in the list. Right. And the other, the only other thing you need to know to do this assignment is erase. So let's say we want to erase this fellow right here. Uh, we're gonna do list dot erase, and we just pass in the iterator. That delete fifteen, and we set the iterator equal to the result of the erase. So when you erase something out of a list, it returns a pointer iterator to the next element in the list. Before the erase, after the erase, it's now pointing at 20, so this comment's wrong, so it's not pointing at this stuff. And, and then we'll wrap it around again. Okay. So iterator before the erase is pointing at 15. After the erase, it's pointing at 20. Size of the list is 3. And um, we then advanced it one more time, so we were at 20, we advanced it one more time, we got to the end, and then we wrapped it around back to the beginning again. You basically have to do this after every advancement. Just check to see if you're at the end, and then wrap it around. And then output the value. Okay, so this is everything you need to know about the STD list class for this assignment. Y'all have any questions? This is how I do it. Um, in fact, it's how I did it. Out of list of integers, right? All the knights are just known by their number. Didn't have to make a class or anything. Just a list of integers. Knight number zero is the first one. Knight number n minus one is the last one. That's it. That's basically the same right there. Any questions? You guys all got it? Yeah. You'll review a bit? All right. I will put this up as copy main.cc to slash public slash Josephus list demo.cc. So if you guys want to look at this code, you can uh, copy public Josephus list demo.cc to your current directory like that. And that'll give you a copy of all the um, code, or you can just view it if you want. So that's everything you need to know to do the assignment. Pretty straightforward. Just make sure that uh, you wrap around. Um, every time you advance the pointer, make sure you wrap around. That's the that's the key thing. Okay. All right. So let's talk about modules.
So you guys did on the quiz today. By the way, uh, this uh, you'll, you'll understand the uh, the cover artwork for the class today because we're going to learn about modular division today. Currently explaining how modular division works. CSI twenty six students. There you go. This is a meme made last year by my students. All right, um, quiz. basically taking these quizzes counts as your uh, attendance, so make sure you do them. Even if you get a zero or whatever, uh, you still need to still need to take them. That's how we are doing attendance. Okay. So quiz statistics, 83%. Yeah, all right, you guys did pretty well. Pretty well, pretty well, pretty well. Okay. Okay, so what is this uh, horrible number of factorial? Remember, we talked about this in lecture last time. We have a vector, when you have a factorial with modulus, if it if the factorial is bigger than, in this case, 234, you're going to have a times 0 in the factorial, right? Because 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 230 two th times 231 times 232 times 233 times 0 times 1 times 2 times 3. And so once you have a series with a time zero in it, the whole thing's zero. Uh, some people took this number and modulus it by 234. Can't do that. Because um, it's a series, right? Each number in it is modulus by 234. You can't just take this number and, and modulus it. What is uh, this number here in Z3? So... Uh, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, we will uh, be getting to the um, competence exam. I'm trying to add the Discord. The link says invite invalid. Yeah, that's one of the the annoying things about Discord is that it's like you create an invite and then um, it just stops working for some reason. Send the invite to the person. There we go. Okay. So, uh, we are going to learn about modular division today, which is um, not as easy as the other ones. Okay, so with uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, everything works normally. Um, it's actually kind of easy because you can just switch out congruent numbers, however you want, right? So like if you want to subtract, uh, I don't know, three and five, you can switch out three with a congruent number. It's so like, let's say you're in Z10. Three is congruent to 13, right? You guys all with me on that? So if I asked you what three minus five was in, in Z10, switch out three and 13, right? Like you just, it's competency exam going to be on modulus. Yes, it is. It's going to be all modules all the time. So, are you, are you guys with me on that? Like, let me get the uh, tablet set up. Yeah, 
if I asked you what is 3 minus 5 in Z10, and let's say you don't remember like how negative numbers work. Let's say you're working for Google or Microsoft and uh, the notion of negative numbers with modulus just doesn't make sense to you. <laughs> uh, just make the observation that 3 and 13 are the same number, right? And so you can just switch 3 with 13 and minus 5 and you get, you get 8. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's addition, subtraction, multiplication. That, that's it. Like you, you just do normal arithmetic. It's actually easier than normal arithmetic because there's usually like, you, you don't have to like for normal arithmetic, you'd have to like actually do this. You know, there's some, there's some things you can do with modular arithmetic. That's actually a lot easier. Like uh pow -M. uh pow -M is exponentiation with modulus. So if I, if I wanted to ask you, what is 11 to the 100 billion trillionth power modulus 10? What do you guys think? What is 11 to the, I don't know, whatever exponent, some really large exponent? Yeah, it's just one. All right. So if, if you're doing normal math, you'd actually have to take 11 multiply it times itself some unholy number of times. Uh, with pow m, pow m means you're doing pow exponentiation and a modulus. You don't have to. And in fact, uh, even if you're doing it legitimately, like 5 to the 123rd power uh, mod 10, now that one actually has a shortcut as well. Uh, let's make it a 6. you actually don't have to do all that math. Anyone, uh, anyone, there, there, there's no like simple answer to this, but it's actually still easier than, than in normal math. Anyone have any observations on why pow m is easier than pow? I, I, it's fine. I don't, I don't expect you to actually know it. It is, um, kind of cool though. I'm just going to Seaside 26, make a new page for today, which is 8, 17, 21. So pow m is pow with in a modular world. And stop. Capitalizing things. Uh, the GNU multi precision and boost multi precision. Okay. So GMP is sort of the industry standard uh, big int library. Um, normal. Ints are limited to 64 bits. A big int has no bit limit on it. You can have a you can have an int with 100 digits if you want. It's fine. Handles it just fine. So POWM is something that exists in GMP and Boost Multi Precision, Precision, yeah, um, which uses GMP. So. Um, how does pow m work? Let's see what color ink do I want? White. Okay. So let's say I want to take six to the um, sixty-fourth power. Modulus ten. How do I do this? Hmm. Well, let's just start. So six to the first power, mod 10. I'm sure you guys can do that one, right? Six to the first power mod 10 is six, very good justice. All right, six squared mod 10 is also six. Um, 
it's, it's the third power. Modules 10. Let's bust out the calculator. 6 to the third power. It's 216. Also 6. Okay, maybe this one's too easy. <laughs> Let's, uh... Let's do seven. Yeah. Seven to the sixty-fourth power. Okay, what is seven the first, seven to the second, and seven to the third? Mod ten. Hope you guys get that for the first one. Okay, seven squared, very good. Randawa, it is 49, 49 mod 10 is nine, right? Seven to the third power, two calculators, seven to the third power. 343, just wanted to make sure that Windows calculator was correct, so that would be a three. What is seven to the fourth power? One, so the fifth power, seven. Let's see if my mental math held up there. Seven to the fifth power is seven. Good. Seven to the sixth power, mod ten. Nine. Seven to the seventh power. Mod ten. It's three. Again, let's just double check real fast. Seven to the seventh power. Oh, seven to the sixth is nine. Seven to the seventh is three. You don't notice a pattern here. So, 7 to the 64th power uh, is the same thing as 7 to the 4th times 7 to the 4th times 7 to the 4th times 7 to the 4th. Uh, you, you get the idea. Uh, 16 times. Which is what? What is 7 to the 64th power? Let's just verify. 7 to the 64th power, modulus 10, is 1. This isn't for May's little theorem, by the way. This is just, you know, 10 is not, 10 is not a uh, prime number, right? Like I said, sometimes you'll just get a 1 when you do an exponentiation in a modulus. You'll just get a 1 sometimes. That's why with uh, for May's little theorem, if, you're, if you want to test to see if 10 is a prime number, you have to try different. You have to try different numbers in here, and uh, see what you get. Okay, so uh, all right. So that was interesting. We got a little pattern out of it. Hmm. Okay. Let's try with eight, maybe. By the way, when I do math, I like to just kind of work out things and see if we can find a pattern, you know, and then maybe we can uh, develop an intuition for it. And then if we develop an intuition for it, then we can prove it. So I don't like proving something first and then working out the intuition later. I think students understand a lot better if you just kind of work through some examples and then you're like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that has to be true. Okay. Right. So let's, uh, can you explain it if possible? I will. Um, so before uh, seven to the fourth power, right, is one, right, and so if you multi so this is one times one times one times one, right? We do this sixteen times. We multiply one times itself sixteen times, and get 
from one. So let's work through another example. Uh, so eight to the first power is everyone mod 10, eight, very good with everyone being apparently four students. <laughs> um, all right, eight squared, got four, very good. Eight to the third power, uh, maybe two, I think. Let me see if eight to the third power is two. Eight to the fourth power. Eight to the fourth power. Eight to the fourth power is the same thing as eight to the third power times eight, right? Do you, do you concur? Do you guys concur that this is true? Eight to the fourth power is eight to the third times eight. So eight to the third power is the same thing as two. So it's two times eight, which is 16, which is six. Okay. If you're wondering how I was doing that in my head so fast, that's what I was doing. So eight to the fifth power is just eight times six, which is 48, which is back to eight again. And uh, we're gonna loop four, two, six, and so on and so forth. So, um, okay, so if we have the fourth being six, six, then eight to the fourth times eight to the fourth is what? Eight to the third times eight squared, two times four is eight. Yeah, you do it that way. Or I was just taking eight times six is 48. 48 is eight. Here's a pattern of 40 numbers there. Is it always four numbers? Nope. We're just actually getting lucky with that. Um, but uh, so eight to the eighth power is the same thing as eight to the fourth times eight to the fourth, right? Eight to the fourth is six times six. So this is 36, which is six. So eight to the 16th power is eight to the eighth times eight to the eighth which is also gonna be six in this case, making life easy on us. By the way, we're, we're just actually getting lucky with these things. It is 16th power times eight to the 16th power is also six. And so eight to the 64th power, which is eight to the 16th times eight to the 16th is equal to also six. Okay, so we just happened to get lucky. But this general pattern holds, right? So all you have to do is figure out what eight to the first is. And if you know what eight to the first is, you can figure out what eight to the second is. Because eight times eight is 64, 64 mod 10 is four. And then if you know what eight to the uh, eight squared is, then you can figure out what eight to the fourth is by just squaring them, and then squaring them, and then squaring them, and then squaring them, and doing the modules each time. So you can actually compute, uh, x to the nth power mod y and log base two in time. Okay, so this is this is why powm is so fast. This is the powm algorithm. Is that you can compute x to the first, then you compute x to the second, then you compute x to the fourth, then you compute x to the eighth, then you compute x to the sixteenth x to the 32nd, x to the 64th, so on and so forth, all the way up, okay? And uh, if you have a couple points left over, like if we had 65, uh, it would be six times eight, right? Because you have, if you have one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, you make any any exponent just using those numbers. Uh, here, let me show you. So if we do x, eight to the 67th power, eight to the 64th is six, six times, um, eight squared. Let me, let me write it down like this. So if you want to compute eight to the 67th power, eight to the 67th is equal to eight to the 64th times eight to the second times eight to the first. And we know what that is. Six times four times eight. Which is gonna be two.
is that 64? 6 times 4, 64, 64, no, 24, sorry. 24 mod 10 is 4. 4 times 8 is 32. So we get 2. We want to do it the slow way. Go 8 to the 67th power. Modulus 10, and we get 2. So this poor calculator just had to compute some gargantuan some gargantuan number. I didn't have to. I was able to compute this whole thing in just three steps. Well, no, not exactly, but yeah. Why can't we use eight to the third power? You can, which is also two. To be two times six, which is twelve. Two. But the point is you don't have to actually calculate x to the third power. All you have to calculate is x to the first power, x to the second power, x to the fourth power, x to the eighth power, x to the sixteenth, thirty second, sixty fourth. You only have to do log base two in work. Okay. Let's work through one more example. Give me some numbers, people. Yeah, it's it is it is a very cool algorithm, and it's it's possible. Um, in the world of modulus, it's not possible for real numbers for biggish numbers, right? You can you can do the POW M um, pretty quickly. Log base two is is really fast. If you guys remember, um, anything that's of the order of two to the n is called intractable. This is a, a non polynomial time. Uh, this is an exponential time. algorithm and, and they're called intractable because for any re real sized n like yeah sure you can solve it for you know 10 or whatever but by the time you get up to like 100 which isn't that many things as far as computers go 2 to the hundredth power is a really big number right so any algorithm that's in exponential time a lot of brute force algorithms are that way for example try every uh, chess board position right it's pretty big Pretty big number, you know what I mean? Try every password, all right? If you have 16-digit uh, passwords, trying every password, how many keys do you have on the keyboard? You got 52 letters, 10 numbers, 10 symbols, so let's say 62. You have 62 keys on the keyboard, all right? And if you allow, I don't know, 10-digit password or something, it'd be 62 to the 10th power, possible. 10 digit passwords, something like that. Not counting the special characters. You know. Pretty big number. <laughs> it's a pretty big number, right? So any any algorithm that's of that 62 to the 10th power, it's a pretty big number, all right? So NSA could probably do it, but um, pretty big number. And then all you have to do is add one more digit, then it's 62 times harder. Add one more digit, it's 62 times harder. So anything that's of the running time of 2 to the n, we call it intractable. It's just, it's too hard to solve for anything of any reasonable size. Now, just a, this is just a review of a, Logarithm is a review of 41. Logarithm is the opposite of exponentiation, right? So where exponentiation is hard, logarithm is easy. It's in fact the, the inverse, right? So if you, if you take the log base two of two to the n, you get n, right? So for every doubling of the problem size, you only have to do one more bit of work. And that's pretty cool, all right? So, um, any any order log in algorithm is actually going to be really fast. And so for every doubling of the amount of the problem size, you only have to do one more step. And so that's as easy as the exponentiation is hard. Okay. So for most algorithms, if you can get it down to log in, you're good. Yep. Okay. So if I, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, let's say 
taught IS50B and in IS50B we talk about acceleration structures which are data structures that can be used to determine what um, is in a 3D world. Let's say you've got some castle or something. Draw a little castle. And you shoot a bullet and you want to know what you hit. If you can find what you hit there in order log in time, that's as fast as it needs to be. You understand? So log in is fast. And that's that's fast even for like a video game, right? Like Video games need to do everything like interactively in real time. Okay. So just a little bit of a review of exponentiation and why it sucks. So we actually do not need to compute to the third power. We don't need to compute to the fifth power. We don't need to compute to the sixth power. So we can actually do uh, x to the n mod y in log n time. And you don't actually have to write the, the um, subscript there. Okay, so, uh, all right, so you guys have given me some pretty stupid numbers. Um, <laughs> I don't want to write that using my hand. Uh, all right. Uh, give, give me, give me, yeah, 11 to the 64. All right, 11 to the 64th power, modulus 80. Sure, you can do that. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I just, I don't want to write by hand all those digits you typed. All right. Oops, those actually belong. So we want to compute 11 to the 64th power. So it's 11, we're going to compute 11 to the first, not on 10 anymore. So we are going to compute 11 to the first power, 11 to the second power, 11 to the fourth power, 11 to the eighth power, 11 to the 16th power, 11 to the 32nd power, and 11 to the 64th power. Yes. Okay. Let me just clean up the remainders over there. I guess we don't need to. Okay. So let's do this. So 11 to the first power, modulus 80 is going to be 11. 11 to the second power, modulus 80 is, what's that, 121 modulus 80. Remember, modulus is just subtraction when you're close to the number, so 121 minus 80 is 41. So 11 to the fourth power is going to be 41 times 41 mod 80. And for that one, I will do that. 1681 modulus 80 is 1. Okay, well, that's easy. And then uh, all the rest of these numbers are going to be 1, I think, right? So 1 to the 4th power times 1 to the 4th power seems to me to be 1, <laughs> I think. Let's see uh, what we get here. If we do it for real z's 11 to the 64th power, modulus 80 is 1. Do you guys see what I, why I stopped there? <laughs> one to the fourth power times one to the fourth power is one. And so 11 to the eighth is just one. So 11 to the 16th is just one times one. 11 to the 32nd is just one times one. 11 to the 64th is just one times one. So all these are ones. So that's it. Okay. Will you ever ask us to prove these algorithms in exam? No. I'll ask you to do them, okay. but uh, you don't have to prove them. But uh, the, the the proof's pretty straightforward, I think, right? Like, uh, if you if you want to do x to the nth power, you can compute x to the uh, n divided by two times x to the n divided by two, which is the same thing as x to the n, right? You guys see that? And you can just do that recursively, down to one. And so the number of recursions is log base two of n um, steps.
Do you, uh, do you guys see that? Like in order to compute 11 to the 64th, you compute 11 to the 32nd times 11 to the 32nd, right? Algebra. This is like algebra two level stuff here. Eighth grade, ninth grade math. Make sense? Could you do POW M? Could you implement it in a program? Dead silence on Discord. Right? You do, you compute 11 to the first power, and then you use the, the results of this to compute 11 to the second power, right? 11 times 11 is 121, right? 121 mod 80 is 41. And then you square this one. So you just repeatedly square the number over and over again. And so the number of squares you have to do to get here is just log base n. This is the shortest way to solve it? I think so. I mean, there, there's a shortcut, which is that if you ever hit one or zero, I guess, uh, you're done, <laughs> right? If it's a power of two, right? Um, right, because I, I didn't even need to bother with the rest of these because I hit one, but that's just kind of a little, little shortcut. Yeah, log base two then. So I don't believe there's a faster way. If there is, find out. GPM, pow, M. Let's see what the running time is. So, efficiency bug. Pretty sure it's a pretty sure it's a log order login algorithm based on n. Why do we square the forty one again? Uh, forty one squared uh, eleven eleven squared uh, times eleven squared is eleven to the fourth, right? So what we do is we sort of ladder our way up the uh, exponentiation chain, right? All we need to do to solve uh, any how m function is compute 11 to the first, 11 to the second, 11 to the fourth, 11 to the eighth, 11 to the sixteenth, 11 to the third, so on and so forth, up to whatever whatever we need. Because 11 to the fourth power, right, 11 to the fourth power is 11 squared times 11 squared. So 11 to the fourth is just 41, that's 41, right? So 41 times 41. And I didn't do that one in my head, I just opened up Windows calculator. 41 squared modulus uh, 80 is one. Yeah, 41 is uh, 11 times 11, 121 minus 80 is 41. Okay. Um, 
and then the eighth power is just the fourth, whatever you get for the fourth, times whatever you get for the fourth, and then the sixteenth is whatever you get for the eighth, times whatever you get for the eighth, and you just do that over and over again. You can write them into a table, and then if you get like 60, 11 to the sixty seventh power, eleven to the sixty seventh power is eleven to the sixty fourth power times eleven squared times eleven to the first power, and we know that's one. We know that's 41, and we know that's 11. So this would be 11 times 41 times 1 modulus 80 is 51. So for any, uh, if, it, if it's not an even power of 2, then you have to write down you know, all, the, all the exponents along the way. You just save them into a table. And so when you get to the end, 64 times 11 squared times 11 to the first, and you just look these values up. Okay. So it's 1, 1 times 41 times 11 modulus by 80, 851. Take the biggest power of 2 that goes into the exponent and factor it all out. Yeah, yeah, that's one way of thinking of it. Sure. Yeah, 64 is the biggest power of 2 below it, right? And you can, you can compute how high you have to go by doing log base 2 of 67 and then flooring it, which will give you how many steps you have to do. Uh, in this case, 67 do, 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 log, I think that's log base 10 now. Log base 2 is 6 steps. 1, 2, Three, four, five, six. Ah, it's probably going to be ceiling then because of the initial step. Yeah, that's how many steps you have to do. So, um, yeah. Kind of cool. There might be one plus the floor. Whatever. It's alright. Uh,. You can compute it by right shifting the number. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a break because I forgot to give you guys a break last class. Um, uh, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break if that works for you. And uh, then we will get into modular division, which is one of my favorite uh, ways of melting the brains of students. Okay. So we'll meet back here at 11.15 ish. Okay, you guys cool with that? And I'll just leave this up on the screen so you can uh, stare at the beauty of the POWM algorithm. This is actually pretty cool. And this is actually the algorithm that makes RSA encryption work. So it's not like this is just some like uh, cool mathematical oddity or something. This is this is the basis of RSA encryption, which we will we will get to. Okay, so eleven fifteen. See you guys back here. Let's see, how do, I, how do I leave this up? Let's just close that, I guess. And it's 11.15, let's get going again. So uh, we just did POW M. Now it is time for modular division. So um, here's the key thing to understand, because modular division causes people's brains to meld and come out of their ears. And I, I think it has a little bit of a reputation you know, as you can see from the uh, the cover art on the class of being hard to understand. But if you just think of division, uh, da, 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 da. mouse, there we go. Division is the opposite of what? What is division the opposite of multiplication? Ran off the edge of the screen there. Let's get a little more room. Multiplication. Okay. So if you say two times five, two times ten equals twenty. Uh, then 
2 is equal to 20 divided by 10. This is the core observation. Okay. You guys with me on this? That's the core observation. Okay. You guys cool with that? So if you have uh, x times y equals z, this is the same thing as x is equal to z divided by y. What does that equation say? It says 2 times 10 equals 20. 2 is equal to 20 divided by 10. Make sense, Jock Slammer? It's uh, algebra. Okay. So, all right. If uh, Let's talk about the world of Z10 again, because that's just really easy to work with mentally. Uh, so what is... Uh, um, uh, what is 3 times 7 in the world of Z10? Uh, one. Okay. So 3 is the same thing as 1 divided by what? 3 is the same thing as 1 divided by what? So, what is 8 divided by 3? What is 8 divided by 3? Not two. This is the world of integers. Eight divided by three is the same thing as eight times seven. You guys see that? If three times seven is one, then three is one seventh, and seven is one third. Right, which I should probably have drawn the same way. Hmm? So 8 divided by 3 is 6. Because 1 third is the same thing as 7. And 8 divided by 7 is what? What is 8 divided by 7 in the world of C10? Can you show it visually? I cannot show it visually. It does not make sense visually. Trust me on this. <laughs> it's like you got you got a pizza pie and it's cut in no, no, that trust me, that just does not work with modular division. You have to think of it in terms of the opposite of multiplication. That's how you have to think of it. If you try to think of it in, in terms of like pizza pies and centipedes and I don't know. Like it just it just does not work. Yeah, eight divided by seven is the same thing as eight times one seventh, right? Which is the same thing as eight times three, which is the same thing as twenty-four, which is the same thing as three. Okay. So eight divided by three is six, and eight divided by seven is three. And this is the point at which my wife walked in and went. No, <laughs> I just turned around and walked out. Okay, so that is, uh, these are all in Z10. Yeah, it's all in Z10. Now, uh, Z10's not um, the greatest uh, thing. Now, here's the thing. These things work when you have a inverse. You need, you need to have what's called an inverse, and inverse is when you have this. Okay, that's why I picked 3 and 7. 24 mod 10 is 3. No, 24 mod 10 is 4. Uh, 4. Thank you. Doop. Thank you. Eight times three. Yeah. 
hard to look at numbers and talk at the same time. Okay, so yes, thank you. Eight, eight divided by seven is four. Thank you. Because eight times three is 24. 24 is the same thing as four. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, the, the, key, the key thing here is coming up with an inverse. And um, there's, there's some very interesting properties here. Uh, basically, you only really want to do modular division in a prime modular world. So 10 is not a prime number. Um, so not all numbers are going to have an inverse. That's how it works out. So generally speaking, we restrict modular division to prime modular worlds, which means things like Z7, Z11, Z13, Z17. Understand? What if we had like Z8? It's very much not a prime number, right? What if we had Z8? Let's do some. Let's do some division here. Okay. So, uh, all right. So if we want to, uh, let's see. What do we want to divide? Um, I think I should have it in the PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. Okay. So two times three is six. So six divided by two is three. That's actually true. Okay. If, if it actually divides in evenly, you can just do the division. That actually still works. Right? So in Z8, 2 times 3 is 6. So 6 divided by 2 is 3. Okay. You guys with me so far? This class, this class wildly fluctuates between things that are so trivially easy. You're like, I learned that in second grade. And like... What the hell is happening here? So right now we're in second grade. So please tell me you understand that six divided by two is three. <laughs> this is gonna be a really, really long semester. The trap's about to be sprung, don't worry. Six divided by two is three, yes. <laughs> All right, so check it out. Two times seven is 6, right? 14. 14 in Z8 is 6, right? You guys see that? 14 mod 8 is 6. So 6 divided by 2 is also 7. So, yeah. 6 divided by 2 is both 3 and 7 in Z8. <laughs> this part, I think everyone gets. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 6 divided by 2 being 7 well, just multiply it out. 2 times 7 is 14. 14 modulus 8 is 6. There you go. So... Get that tattooed on your arm if you want. Only in Z8, right? This isn't true for like Z10 or something, right? In Z10, oops. In Z10, 2 times 7 is 14, which is 4. So 7 divided by 2 is 4 in Z10. All right? No, let's see. Wait, sorry. I did that wrong. Uh, I forget what I said. Okay. 
Two is equal. Two is equal to four sevenths. So multiplying by two is the same thing as multiplying by four sevenths, if you want. Yeah. Uh, basically, we don't. Uh, the good news is, if you're not in a prime modular world, we typically will just uh, ignore those cases. So in 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 worlds like Z8, you can sometimes get two answers to division. You can sometimes get no answer to division where there's just no no integer division possible. And it's just a complete pain in the ass. So we typically restrict modular division just to prime modular worlds. So Z11, Z17, Z23, things like that. And the reason for that is because in prime modular, prime modular worlds, every number has an inverse, except zero, which we ignore. Okay. So, um, an inverse is a number that when you multiply it, uh, you get one, right? Two times 10 is 20, 20 mod 19 is one. Five times four is 20, mod 19, one. Three times 13 is 26, 39, sorry. Uh, 39 uh, minus 38 is one. Two times five is 20 is one. Six times 16 is uh, 94, modulus 19. 96, sorry, modulus 19, which is one. So when, uh, whenever you have a prime modular world, you have exactly one inverse for each person. Okay. And this ties into the Fermi's little theorem and all, all the other stuff we've been talking about. But you don't have to memorize all that. Just be aware that when you have a prime modular world, every, every number has one inverse, except zero, which we don't care. Where did I get the brain exploding thing? So if we do a mod division on Z of a prime number, we don't get multiple solutions. That's correct. There's exactly one solution. That's why That's why most people, when they're doing modular division, uh, they will um, ignore the uh, cases where you can get two solutions. Most of the time, most, most textbooks I've read uh, will simply say only do modular division in a prime modular world. Okay. When the Z is a, a prime number, in other words. All right. So let's, uh, let's do that. So, uh, if we've got, uh, these mod modular inverses here, then, uh, doing modular division is actually pretty easy. Like, especially if I just give you these things instead of you having to sit there and all right, uh, <laughs> can we do an example of when modular division is used in the real world? Yeah. R S A. We're getting to it. We're building up to cryptography. <clears throat> so <clears throat> two <clears throat> is the same thing as one tenth and 10 is the same thing as one half. You guys see that? X times Y equals one, then X is equal to one over Y and y is equal to one over x. You guys see that? If x times y is one, then they are multiplicative inverses. It's the technical term, but hopefully you can see that's kind of an ugly y there. Make it a little better looking. You guys see that? If x times y is one, then y is equal to one over x and x is equal to one over y. So if you divide by x, that's the same as multiplying by y. If you divide by y, it's the same as multiplying by x. So if you were to, if I were to ask you, what is uh, 18 divided by two? That's the same thing as 18 times 10. Division by two is the same thing as multiplying by 10. 18 times one half, right? That's the same thing as 18 times 10. You're confused now? Betancourt, does this make sense to you? If you have x times y equals one, then y is equal to one over x and x is equal to one over y, right? They're inverses of each other. Right, like, um, 
uh, 3 times 7 in, in Z10, right? 3 times 7 is 1, so 7 is equal to 1 third, and 3 is equal to 1 seventh. Is this only true because of the x and y thing? This is algebra. This is algebra. If x times y equals 1, divide both sides by y, you know, and you get x is equal to 1 over y. It's just algebra. Eighth grade algebra. So, I thought I'd give you a quiz today asking what is 8 divided by 2 in Z19? What is your answer? Why did you use 2 for 10 there? Right here. They're inverses. 2 times 10 is 1. So 10 is equal to 1 half, and 2 is equal to 1 tenth. I don't know why I put a dot over the 1. Okay. So what is 8 divided by 2 in Z19? Negative 1? I don't think you can get a negative 1. There's no such number as negative 1. A divided by 2 is the same as 8 times 10. 80 modulus 19 is 4. You guys psyched yourself out over that one. A divided by 2 is 4. Come on. This is second grade math. It's A divided by 2. Simple. <laughs> 8 divided by 2 is 4, dude. Come on. I don't know why you're so suspicious. <laughs> right? I mean... 2 times 4 is 8, right? This is one of my favorite topics to teach, by the way. So we didn't need to mod and inverse the whole time? No, no, if it's just regular integer divisions, it's normal and integer division. <laughs> it still works if it if it uh, if it divides out evenly. Yeah. Just remember with uh, discrete math, there's no such thing as a decimal. So if you were to do nine divided by two, nine divided by two is uh, Ninety modulus nineteen, which is fourteen. How do we know what we're multiplying by if we only have the denominator? Remember, eight divided by two is the same as eight times one. What is one half? Ten. Ten. Ten is one half. So dividing by two is the same thing as multiplying by ten. Okay. So let's give you uh, maybe a harder quiz question. What is uh, 10 divided by 6 in Z19. I'll give you a second to think about this. What is 10 divided by 6?
How did I get the 10? It's right here. times one sixth no decimals decimals are not allowed in court this is discrete math the most discreet of all mathematics. So 10 divided by six. Do we need to know that whole table? No, there's, there's a way of computing the modular inverse that's fairly easy. Um, but like, I'll, I'll just give you the table, it's fine. Um, so 10 times 1 sixth is the same thing as 10 divided by 6. 1 sixth is the same as 16, which is 160 modulus 19. Which is 8. You guys want to do one more? You guys think you got this mastered now? You're gonna give us the inverses on the exam? I was planning on it, but if you don't want it, it's fine too. One more, all right. Yep. 17 divided by nine is what? Remember, this is all inside of Z9. Six more, please. Well, I, I haven't taught you guys how to compute the modular inverse. It involves uh, Fermi's little theorem. We got a zero, uh, we got a four, we got a one, we got a four. Your calculator doesn't have mod. <laughs> Use Windows calculator, it has mod in it. Uh, you just have to switch it. If you're in standard mode, it's not going to have a modulus, but you can um, switch it into scientific mode, which has mod here, or you can hit percentage, or you can switch it into programmer mode, and it's got one there. So, um, division by 9 is the same thing as multiplying by 17, so 17 times 17 is 289, modulus 19, oops, modulus 19, I think screw that up. 17 times 17 is 289, modulus 19 is four. Can we do another? Sure. What is 18 divided by 3 and Z19? Six. Yeah, easy. 
Just division, guys. Come on. So hard about that. <laughs> just six. 18 divided by 36. Uh, if you want to do it the long way, you can be like 18 times 1 third, which is the same thing as 18 times 13. Get a calculator, 18 times 13 is 234. 234 modulus 19 is 6. So you can do it the long way if you want. We'll do, we'll do one more serious one. Uh, five divided by four. Or five times four is one. That doesn't mean five divided by four is one. Yeah, five divided by four is the same as five times five, which is the same thing as 25, which is the same thing as six. You guys got it? You ready for the uh, confidence exam now? So uh, if you want to, if you're curious about how you can uh, get the modular inverse without having to run through every number, which is how I think I made this. What's up? You got food? I uh, just put it on the coffee table, please, miss. Nice. I'm in lecture right now. Thanks. So, uh, you know, you could just be like, all right, uh, what's the modular inverse of seven? Uh, two, no, three, no, four. Now, you could do it that way, but that's super like irritating. Uh, the, the correct way of doing it is if you remember what we talked about briefly last time, is that if you have x to the y minus 1th power modulus y, and y is prime, Amazon Prime, uh, brought to you by Rage Shadow Legends. Okay, sorry. Um, x to the y minus 1 power modulus y, is always going to be one. Okay. Rage shadow legends. Yeah. <laughs> so x to the y minus tooth power mod y is the inverse. Because x times x to the y minus 2 power is the same thing as x times x to the y minus 1 power. And if this is 1, then the modular inverse of x is that number right there. x times x to the y minus 2 equals 1. Only works for prime numbers, of course, for y. Speaking of RSA, if you're worried about encryption, have you used Nord VP? <laughs> uh, kills me. Okay, so the, like the, just they have the lamest segues and like over over simplified history and things like that. Yeah. Uh, Lord. Okay, so do you guys see that? So if you want to find the modular inverse of x x times something is 1, right? And we know that x to the y minus 1th power is 1, if y is prime. So all you do is you just compute this number. So if you want to take the modular, you want to get the modular inverse of x, that's simply x to the y minus 2 power. So for example, if we wanted to compute the modular inverse of 7, there. Uh, 7, okay, so we take 7 to the y minus 2 power, so 7, uh, let's switch back into scientific mode, uh, 7 to the 
17th power, right? Y is 19. Y is our prime modular world 19. So X to the 17th power is that modulus 19 and we get 11. So that's a very simple way of getting the modular inverse. I've seen really complicated ways of doing it. Um, yeah, I don't know. You use POWIM probably to speed it up. Yeah. Protect your browser history from your mom with Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> Speaking of modular division, how about dividing your armies in Raid Shadow Legends? <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Uh, so do you guys see that? Like, if you want to compute the modular inverse of 9, you take 9 to the y minus 2 power. Y is this, right? So like if you're in if you're in Z19, Y is 19. Um, so if you want to compute the modular inverse of 9, 9 to the 17th power, modulus 19 is 17. So it's an easy way of getting modular inverse. So I, I plan on just giving it to you then. Okay, so yeah, that is modular division. Um, yeah, so if, if y is a prime number, every number other than zero, obviously, has one inverse. Okay, so. Um, this is the proof of Fermi's little theorem. Um, I don't know if we need to go through the proof. Um, yeah, it's kind of a cool proof. Let's go through it. So if every number other than zero has exactly one inverse, then if you take uh, one times two times three times four, um, a multiply. Yeah. Then uh, what happens is that if you uh, multiply all these numbers by some number, you get a permutation, right? So if you multiply all these numbers by um, any number, instead of being one, two, three, it might end up as like three, one, two, or three, two, one, or one, three, two, or something like that. So if you multiply all the numbers by a number, because every number has exactly one inverse, it'll just reshuffle the numbers. This doesn't work for like Z8 or anything like that. So what happens is you um, take one, two, three, one, like let's say you're in Z13. So you take the numbers one times two times three times four times five, all the way up to times 12. Remember, no zero in there. You multiply them all by A, and it's the same number, so it just reorders them. Because there's exactly one inverse for everything. So, you then collect the A's like this. Uh, you collect all those A's out to the side. You cancel out the series of 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 on both sides. You end up with A to the 12th power mod 13 equals 1. Or more generally speaking, A to the Y minus 1th power mod Y is 1. So this is the proof of Fermi's Little Theorem. And it's based on the observation that in a prime modular world, there's exactly one inverse for every for every number. It's kind of cool. So if you take all these numbers and multiply them by any number, it just shuffles the numbers. So it's actually a kind of a fun way of doing shuffling, honestly. Are we going to have numbers that break calculators? I uh, wasn't planning on it, if you want. <laughs> it's like, if, let's say we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and we multiply everything by... Uh, times five times six times seven times yeah it's it's just a smaller one uh, this is gonna be really annoying yeah I'll just leave it there so um, you guys understand that though like if you if you take it uh, if you have a bunch of numbers in a prime modular rule you multiply it by a number each number corresponds to exactly one other number. And so um, when you multiply it, it just shuffles them. 
So that's the proof of Fermi's little theorem. This is called. It's not Fermi's last theorem. That was the uh, the famous one that uh, he claimed had a beautiful proof to it that uh, it took modern mathematicians hundreds of pages to to prove. Uh, it's unclear if Fermi actually did have a proof to it that worked or not. Uh, but this is called Fermi's little theorem. Okay, and this is uh, this is how you can compute the mo the modular inverse. All right. um, Yeah, so here's, here's the equation that I told you earlier. If you want to get the modular inverse of x, you take x and raise it to the y minus 2 power, because that times x to the y minus 2 is x to the y minus 1, which is 1. So these two numbers times each other will always be 1. Easy way to find the inverse. Um, I've seen code online that does something very different. I'm not really sure why. Powim is pretty pretty easy to do. So um, no, It's pretty easy. Just take the number... Raise it to the y minus 2 power, mod it by y. There you go. This can be computed in log in time. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, so Shahab was asking what are some uses of this? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of. There's a lot of uses to modulus and. We've been kind of leading up towards uh, RSA encryption, which is um, not actually the kind of encryption used nowadays in a lot of cases, but it kind of gives you an understanding of how modern cryptography kind of came about. So we can talk about that next, after the break. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Brought to you by our sponsor. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, recording in, good. All right, so we're gonna get in on RSA encryption. So to recap today, uh, we went over lists and how to use them for the um, Josephus assignment, which is due on Thursday to start a class. Make sure you guys get it done so you're not being exploded by something at the last second. Uh, we then went over the POWM uh, function and how you can um, use uh, exponentially increasing numbers to compute any POW to the modulus in log in time, which is really nice. And then we talked about modular inverses and modular division. So if three times seven is one, dividing by three is the same as multiplying by seven. And dividing by seven is the same as multiplying by three. That's that's the main that's the main kicker that people have trouble with for modular division. You just have to think of it in terms of one seventh is the same as times three. One third is the same as times seven. Once once you kind of get that into your head, it's really pretty easy. And if I give you the modular inverses, it's it's really easy, right? So eight divided by seven is the same as eight times three. Okay. So um, eight divided by three, is the same as eight times seven. So <coughs> once you understand this, it, it all makes a lot more sense. So rather than thinking of it in terms of division, think of it in terms of multiplying, right? So you're multiplying by a seventh. Gurney, share your screen. Oh, well, yeah. Sharing the screen might help, yeah. Anyhow, uh, I mean, it's all stuff that you uh, you know anyway. So eight, 8 divided by 7 is the same as 8 times 3. 8 divided by 3 is the same as 8 times 7. So. Are we recording? Yes, it is recording. All right, so... Uh, so that's what we've gone over today. We've gone over the Josephus problem with lists. We went over POWM, um, and we went over modular division. Okay, any questions about any of those three before I inflict more sanity damage on you? <laughs> no? You guys got it all? You can all do it on the, on the quiz? First company's exams coming up. So we got to do got to do RSA first. Uh, hashing maybe we might actually do a separate company's exam on hashing because it's pretty important. So we got two questions coming down the lines here. 
Um, for modular division, I'm only going to make you do it in prime modular worlds. Okay, so don't worry about it for like Z8 or Z10 or things like that. You're going to review the lecture? Okay. All right. Such is life. Okay. So let's talk about... Let's talk about encryption. So encryption is... Um, Let's see, is it here? Final module selection. I don't know if I'd go that far, but let's turn off this face blinding thing here. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. That's a more comfortable dark mode experience. So we are going to talk more about modulus uh, today and on Thursday. And then we'll probably move on to hashing, which is also modulus for a little bit. Uh, on Thursday, your Joseph assignment is due, and then you're going to get your next programming assignment, which will be doing uh, RSA encryption. So you're going to have to write RSA encryption from scratch. So pay attention. OK, so RSA encryption. Um, Let's first go into like what like we got forty five minutes to talk about the history of all encryption. Uh, okay, so uh, really, really briefly, some uh, like back in the day, if you published your encryption algorithm, like people in general would be able to decipher it. Right, so like if the if the um, if you did a Caesar cipher where like A becomes uh, you know Q and like B becomes Z, have you ever have you ever seen these before? C becomes uh, O, right? These Caesar ciphers where like you know Bill would become Z and whatever, um, and then you you can use that to go backwards. If you published this anybody be, would be able to decipher your code, right? And, and, or your, your message. When the Nazis had the Enigma machine, uh, the Americans or the British or the Canadians, somebody captured an Enigma machine. I think there's a movie about a U-541 or whatever with Matthew McConaughey or something like that, about the capture of, a, of an Enigma machine. And they were able to reverse engineer it and then break the... Uh, Nazi communications using one of the world's first computer systems built by Alan Turing, uh, as described in the movie The Imitation Game, which is not very historically accurate, but at least gets the war right and the people in it vaguely right. Not personality-wise, just the names were right. And uh, the point is, like, if cryptography traditionally involved keeping your, your methods secret, you know, not allowing people to kind of see your, your, um, how, how you did the trick. And then as long as you had your thing and like your spies in the field had, had a copy of it, you could talk to each other. But if the spies got captured, it would sort of compromise your, your, your whole thing. So the, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, the, uh, There is a type of encryption that is unbreakable. And it's called a one-time pad. Okay. And so for a one-time pad, what you do is you get random data. And uh, let's say you get uh, just random letters or whatever. A, Z, Q, T, P, A, S. You know. And so what you do if you're going to send a... a a message to somebody like help H E L P. What you do is you add H plus A and modulus it by 26. And then the person you're sending it to has to have a copy of this data. So for each uh, one time pad you generate, and the Russians employ people in giant warehouses to do nothing but hit random keys on keyboards all day long. Um, one copy would be held at headquarters, one copy would be on a battleship. And if you wanted to send the message help, you would take H plus A 
and get uh, I probably because A is one maybe and Z is 26 so E plus 26 would be E and and then what they do is they subtract it back out on the other end and what you do is as you go along you cross off the letters so if you send help you would you, you consume four letters off your one time pad and as long as the one time pad is properly generated with random data it is unbreakable it's unbreakable encryption the trouble is is that you have to generate the one time pads and the people on the ship and the people at the shore have to keep the pads in sync if you ever miss a message everything breaks and also if you run out of your one time pad you can't transmit things securely anymore so um you know, and you can't you can't send a new one time pad using a one time pad because every character you send consumes one byte off the other one. Uh, so uh, nowadays we use like satellites, like they'll point a satellite up at the heavens and just read random data, and they'll use that to generate the one time pads. But in World War II, uh, Russia had people in a warehouse typing all day long. What were they typing? Nothing. They were typing absolutely nothing. At all, they were typing random characters. Can you imagine that being your job? What did you do? I type. Oh, really? Do you type uh, reports? Uh, do you work for the Ministry of Agriculture? Nope, I just type. What do you type? I just type letters. Well, what are you typing? Random stuff. It doesn't matter. I just sit there and whack on the keyboard all day long, eight hours a day. Boop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop. That's it. That's my job. I just hit random keys on the keyboard, eight hours a day. Was the pay good? It's Russia. Everybody got paid the same, right? Which is to say, no. It was terrible. <laughs> but, yeah, you can just sit there and put your face down on the keyboard and just kind of roll it back and forth for eight hours a day. And that was your job. You're just generating one-time pads 24-7. So, here's a question for you. Do you think that the keys were hit randomly? Like, maybe when you start your shift, you very carefully hit an M and then a, a Q and then a I, then a Z, you know, you kind of bounce around randomly. Do you think by the end of the shift that people were hitting the keys randomly? Or was there a pattern? <laughs> Soviet Russia was a perfect model to run, run a nation. There are people that think that unironically. You know. Was there a pattern? Like when, if, if you were to just sit there and randomly hit keys on the keyboard, do you think that you'd get an even distribution of all the different keys, all 26 letters, or however many there is in Cyrillic. Uh, do you think it's going to be even, or do you think that, like, uh, I don't know, S, D, and F, H, J, and K are going to get hit more often than the other ones? What do you guys think? No flaws, but my wife left me for a guy who punches random keys for a living. <laughs> Takes a lot of endurance. They should have randomized the keyboard layouts. Yeah, that's actually a really clever idea. Just or or just the the keys um, just switch out the because they would have a, a mechanical thing that would come out and hit the key. Just switch those out because it doesn't matter. It's not like they're typing anything for real. You know, just yeah. It's a it's a good thing. Qwerty more like yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was it was not random, and so basically what would happen is that the keys that are sort of in the center part of the key. The keyboard, people would just sit there and slam the keyboard like this for eight hours a day. And uh, they would keep using the same eight keys over and over again. It's not random. So, what happened was that the Americans hacked a one-time pad, which is supposed to be impossible. One-time pads are provably unbreakable if the one-time pads are randomly generated. One-time pads are unbreakable encryption. There's, they're annoying because you have to like get a one-time pad to your secret agent somewhere, right? Like you have to deliver that to them and that poses a risk. You, the person has to go for a walk in the park, in Gorky Park in Moscow and reach his hand into a hollow of a tree and pull out the one-time pad or whatever and pocket it without the KGB noticing. And Americans would, of course, be followed you know, by a KGB officer everywhere they went in uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, so there, there's that logistical challenge of one-time pads, but they're provably perfect encryption, except they weren't. And so uh, they should have had them put on a blindfold and just press stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the, 
the Soviet Union, uh, I think, to a certain extent, was justified in assuming that the Nazis wouldn't be able to to break the one-time pads. And, and in fact, I don't think the Nazis did. It was Americans that did it. And so, Americans, based on the assumption that the one-time pads were not randomly generated, were actually able to break intercepts. And and, and when you when you have an encrypted um, message like that, uh, you'll just broadcast it over the air because like, nobody can read it. right? The only person who can read the message, help, is the person who has the other end of the one-time pad. And so there were these antennas set up all over the world that would broadcast things on certain frequencies, encrypted messages. Q, 3, R, L, A, Q, Da, Ba, D. And it would just go 24 seven. And uh, the, the Americans had these numbers stations and the Soviets had these numbers stations. And um, it's like some, it's, it's like an aspect of the Cold War that like people don't really know about. Um, And so these radio stations are just going 24 seven. Anyone can listen to them. And so if you have a spy in Washington, DC, you tune into the, uh, you tune into the station at your time, like two o'clock in the afternoon, whatever. And then you write down the numbers. So this means spy number 52, you're up. Yeah. Or whatever. So, yeah, this is all um, really interesting stuff. Um, yeah, it took place during the Cold War. And uh, there's... Um, how was it? It's like the, uh, I remember it. Um, where is it? What's the name? It was like the jackhammer or something. Cold War jackhammer signal. But like you, you can you can get into that, and and they had these giant antenna arrays, and they'd broadcast these things all over the world, and they're mostly using one time pads. So what happened though was that America figured correctly that the Russians were not going to throw away their one time pads because it took a lot of effort to make them, right? And so they they made two assumptions. In fact, some they would reuse, which did happen, and others uh, the SDF and HJK keys would come up more often than others. And so they were able to actually decrypt a, a number of the one-time pad um, transmissions to Soviet agents in America. And so, uh, number of stations, yeah. Um, oh man, what is the, the name of that giant antenna array? Cold War antenna array. There's like these giant ones. Um, Hawaii. What I'm thinking of. No, that's not it. Yeah, like it, like the Cold War is crazy, man. Like it was, you know, all these like massive, you know installations and things like that all those old old school computers yeah so uh the the intercepts were called the venona intercepts and uh 
And so the Venona documents, Venona project, Venona documents. Um, yeah, so it began, uh, yeah, during um, World War II, right? And then it lasted until 1980. And so the U.S. was able to eavesdrop on some, not all, but some of the uh, uh, communications between the handlers in uh, Moscow and secret agents in America. And um, the Venona files are most famous for exposing Julius, codename Liberal, Liberal and Ethel Rosenberg. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg cases were uh, very contentious, right? Like the, these, this was a couple that was executed for espionage during the Cold War, and they were held out to be martyrs, and they were unfairly, um, they were unfairly uh, accused of um, espionage, and uh, uh, they were executed in 1953. So, um, the uh, the case uh, got a lot of attention and people argued they were innocent and things like that. And the thing is like, um, the fact that we've been spying on them wasn't revealed for a long time. Like 1995 was when we revealed it because the Soviet Union had fallen uh, around then. And, um, um, and all these intercepts came out. Another famous person was Harry Dexter White so, um, Alger Hiss was another famous, famous spy who was, um, did he flee? Uh, let's see. He was involved in the establishment of the UN as a State Department official and a UN official. Um, Whitaker Chambers testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee that he had been a communist. Uh, da -da 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 -da. They indicted him. Uh, he was found guilty and received some sentences. Da, 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 da. Okay, so um, it turned out that he was secret agent Ailes and Harry Dexter White was the founder of the IMF or one of the founders of the IMF. He was the highest ranking Soviet asset in the U.S. government. Um, he was the assistant secretary of the treasury under FDR and uh, uh he was, uh, the Bretton Woods Conference founded the International Money Fund, for example. And so Harry Dexter White uh, adamantly denied spying for the United Soviet Union. Um, although he was never a Communist Party member, his status was confirmed by classified documents and the decoding of their communications. So, uh, yeah, it was interesting stuff. Like all the, all the top secret, you know, and cryptography, like all, espionage, all that's like really interesting thing to study. Um, the Venona documents, you can get a book that has them. Let's see. Venona. Books. Uh, which one do I have? Mm, I have one of these in our off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, really interesting stuff. Like, you know, um, not, and, and a lot of people just don't don't know about it, you know? And, and to me, it's like, the fact that we were able to break one-time pads is just like, what? Like, what, really? Like, can you imagine how hard it is to like, figure out like a statistical analysis of like how people hit keyboards and then try to determine if one-time pad, you know, like it's just, it's mind-blowing to it. Yeah. yeah, the Navajo Code Talkers was uh, an American cryptography system that we used during World War II. The poor Japanese were sitting there trying to figure out our secret code when it was just like Navajo guys just talking to each other in Navajo, right? So, <laughs> good luck on that one. You know, uh, you can't uh, you can't decrypt something when they don't have a written language, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, it's all, it's all really interesting stuff. So, uh, Cambridge Five spy ring. Uh, some of the espionage was taken to. Yeah, they stole nuclear secret secrets. Um, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. So, uh, if you want to, if you want to get more into that, uh, let's see if I can find my book on over here somewhere. 
But uh, yeah, like even even American history textbooks oftentimes will will still say that um, you know there weren't any Soviet agents in the U.S. government and things like that. It's like uh, where have you been for the past twenty six years or whatever? You know. So um, it's like uh, pretty conclusive evidence, you know. When you've, when you've got Soviet handlers talking to you, like, you know, yeah, well, I was just helping him out. Well, okay, cool. Uh, cool motive, still a spy. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So RSA encryption was a game changer. So all that, the Caesar cipher stuff and the one-time pad stuff, that's all outdated cryptography now, more or less. Nowadays, everything uses what's called public key encryption. Maybe not everything. Um, we use public key encryption. So how does that work? Well, what happens? Let's say that you're like Glenn Greenwald or some like some journalist, right? And so you're Glenn. You're over here in the UK somewhere, right? What you do is you have a website, and, you, and on your website you publish what's called a public key. Okay. And then you keep very very secret, probably stored on your person somewhere what's called a private key, okay? Then if somebody wants to mail you anonymously something, so you don't even have to write back to them. So let's say there's some secret agent over here or just somebody who's got some information. So for example, um, what was the thing that got, uh, was it the American massacre in Iraq? Uh, was it the Blackwater thing? Um, Yeah, Blackwater. They've changed your name how many times? <laughs> uh, they shot at Iraqi civilians, killing 17 and injuring 20. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. All four were pardoned. Uh, they were ambushed. Yeah, anyway, let's let's say you let's say you're somebody who recorded uh, the shooting here, right? And you want to send it to Glenn Greenwald. Okay. So what you do is you've got your data here. You've got your data, and what you do is you t is you can find his public key. It's on a website. It's perfectly public. That's why it's called the public key. Everybody knows it. And you can take your data and encrypt it using the public key. And uh, nobody can decrypt it unless they have the private key. So what you do is you take his public key and you encrypt your data using it and then you just mail it to him. And nobody can tell what you've mailed to him. They know that you've mailed something to him, right? Like it doesn't hide that. There's other uh, things you need to do to hide that. But basically, um, you know, you can make like a... <laughs> Use NordVPN. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so you can uh, encrypt your data using his public key, and then you mail it to him, and then uh, he decrypts it using his private key. Okay, so the only person in the world that can decrypt this is the person who holds the private key. And that's the beauty of public key encryption, is that um, nobody can decrypt this. Once, once you've encrypted something using a public key, it cannot be decrypted except by the person who holds the private key. And the public key and the private key are related to each other by the power of math, specifically modular arithmetic. Okay. But that's the, kind of the high level. Now, if he wants to write back to you, he can't. <laughs> this is a one way, this is a one way street, right? But let's say that you have yourself a public key, public key key and then you keep on your person like on a little USB drive or something you keep your private key then uh, Glenn can write back thanks just a simple email thanks and he will encrypt it using your public key and then you decrypt it using your private key and then you're like oh thanks and then you can you can communicate you can have two-way communications the public keys are visible to everybody in the world 
And everybody in the world can see that you're talking to each other because, you know, there's no... It, it doesn't hide the fact that you're talking to each other. It just hides what you're saying. And so everybody else will just see random noise coming through, essentially. Um, you know, if you send them an email at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they know you're talking to them at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Like, it doesn't hide any of that stuff. But what you say to them is not known, right? Um, that said, like... You know, if there's like, I don't know, like a, a known Soviet agent and you're like emailing this person regular reports, even if, even if what you're sending is encrypted, you're still sending something to a Soviet secret agent, you know, and so they, you know, they'll probably uh, um, break into your house and take your computer and look through the files, try and find your private key, use that to decrypt the, the emails coming back. They'll probably retain the encrypted emails in case they get the private key at some point and then use it to break the emails open and then they, then they can get your whole correspondence with them. So the encryption breaks if your private key leaks. Yep. That's the weakness. That's the weakness. So if you ever have seen me uh, logging on to the server, watch. Do I type in a password? Nope. I use authenticating with public key, RSA key, 2020-0820. So I have a public private key. Public key is on the server. Private key is kept here on my computer. And so if any of you guys were able to, and don't do this, by the way, I don't like people breaking into my house. Happened once a couple of years ago. Pissed me off. It wasn't a student. It was just some random hooligans that broke into my house and trashed my office, which annoyed me more than anything. All my tax records all over the floor. Oh, I had to put everything back. It's really annoying. Um... But if somebody were to take the private key off my computer here, they would be able to log in as me, which is not good. I used to carry my private key on a USB drive. And so I'd go into school, plug the USB drive in, and then it would log me in automatically. And then I would just pull it out. And it was reasonably secure until, you know, I left my, my USB drive in the computer at the end of class. And then I'm like, damn it. And then I had to regenerate the public and private key again. And after I had done that three or four times, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to use a password while I'm at school. They trashed it, but didn't steal anything. Uh, they stole my Xbox. What was the generation? One? Xbox One? Yeah. No, it wasn't a 360. They left the 360. They took the Xbox One and they left the Wii U. <laughs> Like, if you, if you ever won an indictment of the Wii U, the Nintendo Wii U, they, it was sitting right next to it, and they, 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 took, they took the Xbox One, and they're like, nah, and they just left the Wii U there. It's garbage. They tried taking my TV, but um, I had such a giant nest of cables back there, like, they tried pulling the whole thing out, and <laughs> just this giant maze of cables behind the TV stymied them. Like, they weren't going to sit there and, like, pull the thing apart. So the whole thing was, like, pulled out from the wall. And they're like, ah, screw it, you know, and they just left it. Um, they stole my sword. That annoyed me. Um, that was about it. They uh, took some jewelry, I guess. My, my wife was pretty sad about that. It was left to her by her grandma, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the really annoying thing is, like, uh, the same day, somebody logs on onto Xbox because it, it, my Xbox One was set to auto-log on. I'm like, they're the thieves. And so I call up Microsoft. I'm like, hey, my Xbox was stolen could you tell me where these assholes are? You know? And they're like, no, we can't do that. I'm like, could you unlog me off the account? They're like, no, we can't do that. I'm like, well, what can you do? They're like, nothing. I'm like, could you disable it? Could you block this serial number from using the network? Because this is a stolen Xbox. Like, no. Sorry, buy another one. And the thieves get a free Xbox and can log in as you forever. You know, so I, I end up changing my password and... Um, like, it was just, uh, it was just fantastic. Like, I'm like, these are literally the thieves. We could catch these, these jerks, you know? Like, they're log they're here in Fresno somewhere. We can catch them. They're logged in. Just give me the IP address. I'll do the detective work. I'll give it over to the police. Like, oh, uh, sorry, we, we respect the privacy of our customers. <laughs> what if they sold it already? Then I would go after the people they sold it to and get my shit back. <laughs> hey. 
go in. They're logged in as me. That's my that's my account. Look at the portrait. That's me. You know, police. Look there. That, <laughs> pull up pull up the, uh, the the little avatar on Xbox. You know, that's me. Look, my, my Xbox. Proof of hack the Xbox through the IP address. I know, I know, right? It was just like it was so frustrating because it was like it's right there. It's right there. I know it's stolen. They know it's stolen, and they just don't care. They just don't care. No. Um. The, he went and beat the hell out of them. Probably with it anymore. I don't know. I don't. I don't see what the downside is, McCohen. I don't see what the. I'm not seeing the downside there. Okay. So, um. Yeah, but at least they could turn it over to the police, right? Nope. Nope. We don't do that. So, um, yeah, so this is a public key. And uh, if I go into my SSH directory here, you can see that I've got um, these keys inside of here. And so what I do is on uh, my Windows machine here, I run a key gen program. The key gen program, um, putty key gen, looks kind of like this. And so I can generate a new private public key pair just by clicking on generate. And then you move the mouse around randomly like that. That seeds it. Then you end up with a, uh, what is this? How many bits is that? Uh, I don't know. So this is a public key. And so I can just take this and post it into the authorized keys file here. That's just what's inside of it. Just this text here. And uh, um, the, the key comment is that word right there. that appears when you log in. And then you can save the public key and save the private key. So basically you save the private key, save this key without a passphrase. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and so you just save it into a, a file. And then when you log in uh, in Putty, uh, it won't work if I'm logged in. Let's open up a new window. So when we do that, host key, cipher off. Uh, right there, private key file for authentication. So when I when I connected the server, it just um, I, that it's that PPK file that I saved. And so the the thing here, authorized keys, has a copy pasted version of what you just saw there. My local computer has the private key, and then that will authenticate me because the only person who would be able to uh, to uh, decrypt things using my public key because what's happening is that the server uses my public key and sends me some data and I decrypt it using the private key. The only person that can do that is somebody who has the private key. That's how public key encryption works. And you have to keep the private keys private. That's the weakness in the system. So um, every cell phone uses public key encryption. Every cell phone deep within the guts of a cell phone you have a private key. Do you guys know that? So deep within your cell phone, there's a private key. Okay. And so, you know, if you have AT&T or whatever, and they want to transmit data to you, they use your public key that comes with your phone. And you decrypt it using your private key. And then you transmit data back to them using their public key and they decrypt it using their private key. You guys understand? And actually, uh, what they usually do is usually just share like some sort of secret, and they use that secret to um, transmit data because uh, RSA encryption is a little bit painful, mathematically speaking. But it's enough to authenticate you. Do you guys understand? So, this is your cell phone. Smartphone. You guys understand? And so that, back in the day, back in the day, by the way, cell phones were not encrypted. And so when you transmitted something, um, when you transmitted something to um, the cell tower, it was just in the clear. And so it would transmit, it's I, I may, uh, number, I, M, E, I. Have you guys ever heard that before? I may? Are you familiar with that? Uh, so every every cell phone has a unique IMEI number on it. 
and uh, and that's how they they bill you, right? And back in the '80s and '90s, cell phones were expensive. They were expensive, so um, you, you could only have coverage in like you know major metropolitan areas. Uh, typically, your cell phone would be installed into your car, so they're called car phones originally because they needed power. They were like that big. Uh, one of my neighbors was a real estate agent who uh, uh, was you know, fairly well off. Real estate agents in San Diego in the 80s did pretty well. And uh, he, he would drive around in his convertible drop top with a cell phone. And dude did a lot of cocaine. Ended up getting divorced. Who knew? Who knew? Jeff Eldridge. Good guy. Um, and uh, and so he would, he would talk to people on his car phone. And the, uh, and the thing is, is that if I had, uh, you know, any technical expertise at the time, which I didn't because I was a young kid, um, I could have listened as his cell phone talked to the tower and written down his IMA number. And then I could reprogram my cell phone, which I didn't have because, again, I was a kid and also very poor. But if I had one, I could reprogram the IMA on my cell phone, which I didn't have, to his. And then it would bill him every time um, I called somebody, right? So the, uh, how old is Kearney? I was born in 77, so I'm uh, 43 years old. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid of the 80s. And so this would have been uh, 84 or so, maybe a little, little older than that. When did car phones come out? Uh, history of car phones, 70s, okay. Uh, 82, first 1G systems. Okay. No. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's a, quite a bit younger than I thought. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cocaine. Metal off hopes. Yeah, so anyhow. So back in the day, like, cell phones were not secure. And it was a very big deal that people would spoof cell phones. Because they charge per minute, like a lot. And so, um, you know, hackers would spoof other people's IMA numbers and call people. It doesn't work for receiving calls, right? Because now you're them and you'll get their calls, which is also probably a problem. But nowadays, every cell phone has a private key baked deep within the system. Now, let's put on your hacking hats. We got three minutes left in class. If you were the NSA, how would you go about uh, if you wanted to eavesdrop on people's cell phone communications, how would you do so? How would you how would you do it? For all intents and purposes, public key encryption is unbreakable, and we'll go into the algorithm for it on Thursday. This is just conceptual stuff. Pull up to their backyard. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just go in and hit them with a hammer until you get the no. Um, Become an e-girl, join their Discord server. <laughs> Create another app that secretly listens. Yeah, that's what the FBI did do. They created a, uh, a, a quote-unquote secure uh, cell phone for criminals and sold it to criminals. And the criminals thought it was really secure. But it wasn't. It was actually just sending everything to the FBI. <laughs> NordVPN ad coming. Yeah. Uh... FBI agents are no match for NordVPN. Um, yeah, so that 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 was a, that was hilarious, honestly. Um, where they sold apps to criminals and the criminals would use them. Um, now, what the NSA did was they went to the company that made these things and copied their files. So, somebody somewhere has you know a computer that generates the public keys and private keys and they, they have like an Excel sheet or probably something a little more professional than that. Maybe, maybe not. And the NSA just broke into the office and stole the Excel spreadsheet and they got the private keys for one third of all cell phones in the world with one break in. Yeah. So uh, single point of failure right there. You know what I'm saying? Single point of failure. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there's a, 
book I have over here. That uh, is a lot of fun. It's called Cyber Spies. Um, this episode of Computer Science 26 is brought to you by Gordon Carrera and Cyber Spies. <laughs> when I upload YouTube, it asks, it asks to ask you, do you have any uh, advertising or paid sponsorships? And the answer at YouTube is no, I don't. I'm not getting paid by any of these. I am simply being sarcastic. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Cyber Spies, is, it, it really is an interesting book, and it talks about, like, um, all the different ways that these unbreakable systems are, are broken. You know, there's a lot of human uh, human faults, and it talks about Huawei and um, what people do to... Because uh, nobody trusts Huawei routers, you know? So they have a secure facility. In, in America, you can't use them all at all. Huawei routers are not allowed in America for national security concerns. Um, in England, though, they allow them, but they have to audit every single inch in line of source code. But Huawei is like, we're not going to give you our source code. It's our trade secret. And so what they set up was this vault with, you know, like 12 inch thick steel doors that has a router and the source code on the inside. And so uh, British intelligence agents can go in there and examine the router and examine the source code, but they can't take it out. They can just look at it. And so they go, they, they pour through the code line by line uh, to see if there's any uh, vulnerabilities or backdoors built into it and um, and then when they compile it using that source code there's a it's called an md5 hash that identifies it and uh, as long as the hash matches that has been approved by the uk's uh ministry of Def uh you know whatever uh mi6 or whatever you know and uh, and then it's allowed but if they if huawei wants to do a new firmware update or something it has to go through that approval process again they can't just push out a new Firmware, it has to be approved by MI6 or MI5 or whichever MI it is. Cyber Spies by Gordon Carrera. Yeah, yeah it's, one. it's a good book. It's really, it's really, really neat. Uh, and then I've got uh, uh, the Venona Intercepts book around here somewhere. Um, that one's really fascinating, too, because uh, like in, in, when I took AP US History, it was like the Red Scare was, uh, you know, completely baseless. You know, there were, there were no... Uh, there were no uh, high-level spies in the U.S. government. I'm like, uh, yeah, the assistant secretary to the treasury. Like, <laughs> I, I would say that was a fairly high-placed, important spy. Yeah. So, commies ever... I, w I don't know if I'd go that far, but... Um, yeah, there, there's certainly a little more nuance than what my uh, AP U.S. history textbook said, for sure. Sounds like a boring and painful job. Yeah, somebody's got to do it, though. So, the Huawei riders are cheap, so you know, there's a need for them. Uh, it seems as crazy as getting paid to slap a keyboard all day. <laughs> um, getting Liberty Prime vibes. <laughs> Better dead than red. <laughs> no, but like the, the history of the Cold War is actually really fascinating. And there's a lot of stuff that went on in the, in the Cold War that like just people just don't know about, you know, like when people would shoot each other over the DMZ in Korea and just nobody talks about it. You know, um, so, uh, there is, yeah, uh, you know, we can, we can look back at it now and be like, oh, you know, it's whatever, you know, but at the time, you know, the, you know, there was a genuine fear that there would be nuclear war between the U S and, and the Soviet Union, you know, and all these different proxy wars around the world in Vietnam and Korea. There's always these fears that it would like escalate into a nuclear war, and uh, and so there's always that sort of underlying tension in the world, you know, like, you know, I lived in San Diego, and you know the question was if they nuked San Diego, would it hit my house, right? If they hit downtown San Diego, that's like 20 miles away, 10 miles away, something like that. Might be okay. I don't know. Depends how big the nuke is. If they hit the Navy Yards, they're right next to downtown. Should be okay. Maybe. I don't know. If they hit Miramar Naval Air Station, where Top Gun is, while well, I lived right next to it, that wasn't good. You know? And everyone's sort of like sitting there on, on mass, sort of like measuring out like what the atomic fireball radius is, you know, just to know, you know what would happen if there's a nuclear war, right? See you in court. Um, 
do I have a home security brand that I recommend? No, nah. I just don't use, don't use Amazon, um, uh, dots or anything like that. Um, don't use Google. Um, you know, none of the Alexa, Siri, turn off all that stuff. Turn it, your, uh, your TV spies on you, by the way. And this, I don't know. It, it, it's one of those weird things. Like it just, it just makes you sound like, um, like one of those, like Alex Jones, tinfoil hat, um, wearing people. But, um, yeah, they found that LG, LG TVs were recording every video you played on them. It's so, like if you put in a DVD and played it, the, the TV would be like, Oh, he's playing Dr. Who. And it mails it back to LG, you know? And even if you turn off the privacy settings, it still did it anyway. So the only, the only secure way of having a smart TV, which is all of them these days, is to simply not turn on the internet on it ever. You know, um, I, I had a, I had a Samsung TV and I had it set to not update the firmware. It updated the firmware anyway and turned ads on. Yay. So I turned it back. I returned it to Best Buy. Uh, is there a way to disable the recordings? You need, yeah, you need to not, you, you can filter. If you set up a, a, a proxy or a filter going out through your network, normally firewalls allow all data out. And so if your TV wants to send something to LG, it just does. And your home, home network is set up to allow it. Right. So you have to like null route all of the IP addresses associated with advertising and telemetry and things like that. Uh, you can set up a pie hole for dealing with, um, advertising, things like that. Um, some connect to the internet through Bluetooth. Yeah. And some TVs will actually look for an open Wi-Fi. So even if yours is locked down, they'll search for an open Wi-Fi channel and broadcast your, your data back through that. So really the only solution is just to disable, disable Wi-Fi on it entirely and use it as a dumb, dumb TV. All right. Uh, get a laptop or something string through that. What if you take out Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antenna? <laughs> yeah, that should be fine. <laughs> You'll be fine if you take that out. But honestly, I think if you just disable it, it, it should be fine. Um, the uh, the scariest thing uh, was uh, the Weeping Angel. Have you guys ever seen the Weeping Angels from uh, Doctor Who? Um, so these like statues that they only move when you're not looking at them. Um, so there was a hack that the NSA or CIA created, uh, and, uh, uh, developed by the CIA and MI5 led a Samsung, a Samsung smart TV pretend to turn itself off. So it was actually really clever. You would turn off the TV, the light would go off. You think it's off. Nope. Cause remember TVs have, um, microphones on them, right? So, um, uh, yeah, it, it'll record so they can record your conversation in your living room, um, and while appearing to be off, right? So, um, only worked on some TVs and, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting thing. If you unplug the TV completely, it's unplugged, you know, just like if you turn off your cell phone, uh, it used to be, um, you can pull the battery out. Nowadays, cell phones don't allow you to pull the battery out. So, um, yeah, it used to be, you can just pull the battery out. Then, you know, it's off, right? Cause even the CIA can't violate the laws of physics. Um, but, uh, now like if you turn, like if your cell phone's quiescent, it's not off, it's still on. It's just the screens off. You understand? It's still connected to the cell phone tower. That's how you get text messages, right? And if you're connected to a cell phone tower, then you, they know where you are physically, right? Uh, because if you have two or three cell phone towers, they can triangulate your location to within 10 meters or so. And so, um, you know, we've used that to uh, drone strike people, right? If somebody's talking, uh, you know where they are. So you drop a rocket on them and blow them up, right? Uh, we don't do that in America, but in other countries, we have drone strike people. Um... So, you know, you have to turn your cell phone all the way off. Like you actually have to power it off to it for it to not be, uh, you know, tracking it at all times. Like essentially your, your cell phone carrier knows where you are at all times because your cell phone's on and you carry it with you. 
So they, they don't really need to do much more than that because all that data can be pulled from T-Mobile. They don't have to hack your phone um, to know where you are. They just have to get the data from T-Mobile or at d or whatever. So, um, yeah, and again, this sounds like Alex Jones conspiracy stuff, but it's just, you know, it's just the reality of the situation. So, um, yeah, they don't, they don't need to inject microchips into your blood with the vaccines, which baffles me as a computer science person, because do you know how big a computer chip is and how much power it takes to run? Like, how the hell, are, like, have you seen the vaccines? They're transparent. Like, we have transparent chips now, like, that don't take power to run. Like, what kind of, like, <laughs> nonsense is this, you know? Like, have you ever seen this? Like, they're not going to go into your, your, your veins. Like, it just, none of it makes any sense. Only people that are completely ignorant of, like, how, you know, computer chips work would think that they can inject a computer chip into your, your blood with a, with a vaccine. They don't need to. They have your cell phone. <laughs> you know, be paranoid about things that are realistic. Be paranoid about if you want to. Uh, TI-1000 fluid. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, like, when I, when I had a lunch with uh, Richard Stallman, we all just turned off our cell phones and, you yeah, figured that was good enough. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, there, it's, it's a really interesting world we live in because there's some really powerful tools for privacy. Uh, not even, you know, the very powerful agencies can break public key encryption the, you know, hard way. They have to go about, uh, getting the private keys one way or the other, um, to, to bypass it. So, um, you know, we have, we have really good tools for privacy these days, and we have uh, really good ways of violating privacy these days, and this is a very interesting world we live in. So we will uh, pick up the uh, conversation on Thursday, and we will actually go through how public key encryption, specifically RSA, works. Uh, spoilers involves modulus. Okay. Didn't he come to CCC one time? Yeah, he stayed at my house, and he, he spoke at, a, he spoke at a, our college. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, on the wall behind me, um, if you can see that, yeah, that sticker right there, yeah, Stalin gave me that sticker. Just thanks for letting, letting him stay at my house. Yeah, weird dude, weird dude, cool dude, I like him, weird dude. Um, got on, got on pretty well. He's very, he's very, uh, privacy and security conscious. So, um, it's in- interesting talking to him about it, but I, I'm in sort of a, a middle ground, uh, on the, on the matter. All right. So see you guys on Thursday and, uh, I'll put up a quiz on modular division today. Cool. Cool.